pierce the eye, essentially open the eye, there, the first thing that God looks at is a mirror, mirror of him or herself. And that is done with the idea that this, the only one who can take that power is the deity himself. And it's also a power saying, look, you look at your power, now calm your power. Because this is so powerful it can destroy. So the, in that one act, the deity sees what it is. And it also understands, it contains the power. It's like a, atomic ray, radiation that's contained and back, bounce back on it. Thereafter, when you go and worship at the worship floor, and all the power of the various rituals that come into the deity come back to the worship. He says there are many hymns, the famous uh, poet uh, Surdas who wrote uh, Darshan Dio Ghanasham to Krishna means uh, let me see you and he was blind. So the, this Darshan or let me see you is to see not the form but the power beyond the form. And uh, people are often transported, as you may have seen, it depends on the circumstance. Uh, they can be transformed. In little ways they can come home smiling and say, Oh, the, uh, today uh, uh, Swami Narayan Bhagwan looked very nice, he was kindly, he was having a good time. Or some other day saying, today wasn't such a nice day, he seemed to be thinking about something. Or they can say, Oh, I feel much happier today or tomorrow. So it's both ways. They, com contem they make a commentary on the, on the image itself as to how that image is. What they think uh, Swami Narayan or Krishna Bhagavan or Shakti Maharaj is looking at, like that day when they go to worship, as well as what it has done to them, if it has done anything to them. Uh, many stories of uh, these poets and poetesses writing about this idea of darshan, much, much more so in the popular idiom, uh, rather than talking about uh, smaran and uh, those internal forms. Those are more elevated forms. People talk about them. One of the best ways to die is to go into contemplating the divine and then be liberated in that process. You merge with the divine through that act of devotion. You don't come out of it. And of course, that's a very elevated form of going. Because essentially, you haven't gone, the deity has embraced you. And uh, certainly, uh, there's a lot of stories of how that happened. Like, I, for instance, the Swami Narayan Bhagwan who came, how did he depart the earth? I don't know, but maybe you know the story. When his 60 odd years were over, and he decided to leave the earth, how did he vanish? Did he vanish in a cloud of perfume or did he manifest him in a heap of, of uh, rose petals or did he simply sit down, cross his feet and say it's time to die and simply die? Uh, I don't know the, uh, the story. But uh, there are many ways in which deities leave the earth, especially in the Hindu notion of incarnation, avataric, revisitation, they all come and they all have to go. And many of them go by ordinary ways. Krishna is killed, is this reclining in the forest under a tree and a huntsman takes a bow and arrow and shoots him. And shoots him in his heel and the arrow travels through, goes out from top of his head. And uh, the name of the huntsman is Jara which means old age. So there are many reasons, and the arrows, of course, traveling through his body, going up. Mm. So that's one. Uh, other, uh, I think Rama walks into the river and uh, vanishes. Now, another thing I noticed... Uh, I don't know about others. Shakti Ma mm -hmm. goes into the earth. You know, she... Uh, uh, when she, when her divinity is discovered, mm -hmm. then she can't live amongst men anymore. Uh, so she 
travels to another village and then tells the earth to open the earth open and she goes into the ground. Which is what happens to a lot of Indian female avatars. Same thing happens to Sita, the heroine of the Ramayana. She is born in a furrow. When her father is plowing a field, he finds her in a pot. That's what her name means, the furrow. And when she dies, uh, when it's time for her to go, she considers the earth her mother, and the mother opens and she walks into it. So, okay. So, what is, what's your question? Oh, uh, another thing I noticed in, uh, in, in the temples uh, that I visited, Swaminarayan and, and just uh, other Hindu, Hindu temples, was the, um, the use of fire. Um, in, in the RT and um, in the flame, I was wondering if you can explain further the uh, the importance and the meaning of of, of flame uh, in ritual. Well, of course, flame is a very there are many interpretations of flame. Uh, one of the most important is the flame is like a cleanser. Uh, it destroys without any trace. So, when it consumes, it consumes totally. Uh, it cleans, uh, you know, the forest of doubt. Flame runs through the forest, cleans out the forest. So you don't know what is confusing. So it's a great cleanser. Uh, flame is also uh, the remover of doubt. When there's doubt, then flame is it removes that notion of doubt. Uh, flame is also understood to be uh, the mouth of the gods, especially in aid in this Indian ritual is composed of three components. We talked so far about worship as known as puja, whereby you take material things, flowers and fruits and other things, and you put them and offer them. The fruits of the bounty of the earth you offer the divine. The divine consumes it and gives it back to you. As benediction, you consume itself. In addition to that, there is another way in which very central to Hindu worship, especially for those uh, rites of passage uh, that are very important. When you marry, you marry around the flame. What is the witness to your marriage is the sacred fire. The sacred fire is serving as your witness that you are married. The sacred fire also, at the time of your death, is the one that's going to take you away from this world, cross you over to the next world. The sacred fire takes your prayers and your offerings of oil and buttermilk, I mean, uh, not uh, ghee and uh, grain and other things in the fire for the gods. The gods consume what you offer because through the fire. And uh, so fire is crucial uh, to almost all transitions. Uh, the third way in which you worship is through sacrifice. Now that's becoming less and less popular, but blood sacrifice, killing a chicken, killing a goat, killing a buffalo, killing yourself, uh, sacrificing yourself. Uh, and uh, of course sacrifice is always surrogate. You know, you offer the divinity something that you value in substitution of yourself. And uh, it is seen to be a very uh, potent form of worship. Now, uh, uh, there are a few and fewer places where there is life sacrifice. Uh, in Kalikar Temple in Calcutta, even today, every day, hundreds of goats are sacrificed. In Gujarat, now that's almost unheard of uh, in, in Hindu temples. But uh, for instance, in Dhanagadra, I think in my grandfather's time, which is approximately, you know, 1910, 1915 onwards, so the last hundred years, in Dhanagadra, sacrifice of animals ended. But before